Today I've got a nice problem that was from the 1993 Irish Math Olympiad. And it has to do with something that they are defining to be a good number. And this kind of notation of calling something good or nice or things like that is actually fairly common in mathematics in order to just give something some sort of offhand characterization that doesn't hold outside of the problem or the paper or whatever we're looking at. So this isn't like a universal definition. This is just a definition for this problem. Okay, so anyway, let's get into it. So let's call a natural number n good if we have unique numbers, a1, which is bigger than or equal to a2, which is bigger than or equal to a3, all the way up to ak, they're all natural numbers. There are at least two of them, and they satisfy the following rule. So n is equal to a1 plus a2 plus all the way up to ak, but it's also equal to a1 times a2 times a3 all the way up to a k. So that means these numbers simultaneously form something called a partition of n and a factorization of n. And then our goal is to describe all good numbers. And as we'll see, this uniqueness right here is really what uh, decides whether a number is good or not. But Let's maybe get into some exploration so that we can make a conjecture which we will prove and thus solve this problem. Let's maybe start with the number nine. And notice that nine maybe factors as three times three. Three plus three is only six. So we might as well factor it including some ones as well. So we can factor that as three times three times one times one times one. But notice that's the same thing as three plus three plus one plus one plus one like that. So now next we'd like to maybe see if we could exhibit another, you know, construction of nine like this. But let's notice the only way to do that would be to have a nine times a string of ones. But if we have a nine times a string of ones, when we do nine plus a string of ones, then we'll get something larger than nine. So that's a little bit of a sketch why this is indeed a good number. Now we'll see that a little more clearly when we do the careful proof, but like I said, nine seems to be a good number. Okay, so now let's look at the number six maybe. Notice that six is maybe a classic example of a good number because it is the same thing as three times two times one and three plus two plus one. So there, three and two are both primes. So let's notice the only way, other way to exhibit six as a multiplication problem would be like six times one. And so that would combine the three and the two. But if we have a six times one, then six plus one will be larger than six. And so that's kind of a sketch of the idea for why this is also a good number. So let's maybe look at another one. What about the number seven? Okay, well, seven is a prime number. And so if we factor seven into at least two factors, then it's gonna look like seven times one. And then our only other choice for numbers will, will be one. But notice that is not equal to seven plus one. So seven fails to be a good number because it's impossible to even write it like this in the first place. We don't have a problem with uniqueness with seven. We have a problem with existence. So let's maybe put an X next to this. So X, um, seven seems not to be good. So let's maybe look at the number eight and let's notice that eight can be written as two times two times two. So it's two cubed, but two plus two plus two is six. So we need two additional ones here to add back up. So two plus two plus two plus one plus one, that makes eight. But the problem here is that we can form another construction of eight by combining these first two twos. So this is the same thing as four times two. Four times two is eight. So we'll put a times one times one like that. And then we have four plus two plus one plus one. So in this 
case, this number is not good because of the uniqueness criteria, not because of the existence criteria. So now let's see what changed when we went from a good number to two examples of numbers that aren't good. We'll notice that each of these can be factored as exactly the product of two primes. So here our two primes are equal, but it's still a product of exactly two primes. And here over here, our two primes are unequal, but it's still a product of exactly two primes. Whereas down here, the number seven is a product of one prime, and we get non-existence of this kind of construction. Whereas the number eight is a product of three primes, and we get existence, but we do not get uniqueness. So the thing that's going on here is like if we've got a product of one prime versus two primes versus three plus primes, you see that one prime, it is not that we do not have existence. So we'll say that this does not exist. With two primes, there exists a unique construction like this, but over here there exists, maybe I'll put many, maybe there's at least two. So we do not have uniqueness. So this is as much exploration as we'll do, but maybe a good example for you guys to do to maybe convince yourselves that this is exactly kind of what's going on here is we need n to be a product of exactly two primes is to look at the number n equals 30, which notice n equals 30 is five times three times two. That's a product of three unequal primes. And we can exhibit that two ways as a sum and a product of the same numbers using our strategy that we used for eight. Okay, so anyway, we're done with our exploration. Now let's move into the solution. Now we're ready to make a careful statement off of that exploration that we did on the last board and prove that careful statement, which will indeed solve this problem. And I'll do that with the following claim. So a natural number n is good if and only if n is equal to p times q for primes p bigger than or equal to q that are not necessarily distinct. I'm just putting this ordering to help the calculation out. This doesn't actually really matter that much. Good. So let's do this reverse direction first. So that means we're going to start with n is equal to p times q and then end with n is good. So let's, like I said, suppose n is equal to p times q with p bigger than or equal to q both primes. And now let's notice we have the following inequality. So p times q using the definition of multiplication is p plus p plus p. How many times? Well, it's going to be exactly q times. So I'll write that. This is q times. Okay, nice. But since q is a prime, that means q is bigger than or equal to two. Two is the smallest prime. So this is bigger than or equal to p plus p. But now p is bigger than or equal to q. So this is bigger than or equal to p plus q. So we have p times q is bigger than or equal to p plus q. But notice that's equivalent to saying p times q minus p plus q is bigger than or equal to zero. In other words, it's a natural number. Okay, so now that we have this taken care of, we will exhibit a construction of n into a sum of a certain list of numbers and a product of the same list of numbers, and then we'll show that that is indeed unique. And so we'll do that just by the following observation. So let's notice that n is going to be the same thing as p times q. Well, that's the definition of n, but then it's going to be times 1. But now how many 1s do we have? Well, we just showed that that number over there was bigger than or equal to 0, so that number over there must be important. And so we'll have exactly p times q minus p plus q total ones. Okay, but now let's notice that that is exactly the same thing as p plus q plus one plus one. How many times? Well, it's going to be the same number of times as we had up here. But notice putting this all together, 
we get that that is equal to p times q. So this equation definitely holds. So we've exhibited the existence of such numbers that do this. So now let's show the uniqueness. So let's suppose that a1 bigger than or equal to a2, bigger than or equal to a3, all the way up to ak, with k bigger than or equal to 2, satisfy this construction again. So it's another factorization of n, and it's another partition of n. But the fact that it's another factorization of n, and we have this inequality, means that the first term must be p times q. So let's just say that. I have said that in words, but what that gives us is a1 is equal to p times q. Okay, but that means that a2 equals a3 equals all the way up to ak is equal to 1. But now let's notice that p times q is equal to a1 times a2 all the way up to ak. But that is strictly less than a1 plus a2 all the way up to ak. So we don't have any equality of this addition problem and this multiplication problem, meaning that that can't be a representation of n in the following format, meaning that the one that we have up here is unique. So that finishes the proof of this forward direction. Now let's move on to the proof of the reverse direction. So now we're ready to prove the forward direction, which we will do with the contrapositive. So in other words, we will assume that n is not equal to p times q for primes that are not necessarily distinct and show that n is not good. But notice this breaks down into two cases. So that first case is n is equal to p, a prime number. So just to reiterate, if n is not a product of exactly two primes, then it must be a prime itself or a product of three or more primes. So that'll make up our two cases. But now if n is equal to a prime, then the factorization like this that we have right here can only have an n and then a bunch of ones. So notice that we have p is equal to p times one times a bunch of ones, maybe only only one one, but even only having one one is a problem because this is strictly less than p plus one plus how many ever ones we have. So in other words, there is no possible construction of n in the needed way. Okay, so that moves us on to case two which is that n factors is a product of three or more primes. But I'm going to write that a little bit differently. I'll write this as n equals m times p times q. p and q are primes. And now m is not necessarily a prime, but n, m is bigger than or equal to 2. So the fact that m is bigger than or equal to 2 means that it factors with an additional prime to add into this. And now we'll show that uniqueness does not hold. So in other words, we can write this two ways as a sum and a product of the same numbers. And those two ways are exhibited by the following equations. So let's notice that we have m times p times q is the same thing as m plus p plus q and then plus a bunch of ones. I guess I'm leaving off my trailing ones here, but I think that's okay. We're deep into this problem, so we know how this is going. So how many trailing ones do we have here? Well, we have exactly m times p times q minus m plus p plus q, which we would, of course, have to show that that is bigger than or equal to zero by techniques like we used before. Okay, so that's one expression of the product of numbers being the same as the sum of numbers. But we can find another one just by putting this m times p together. So this is the same thing as m times p times q and m times p plus q plus a certain number of ones. And how many ones do we have here? Well, it'll be a different number of ones, but it'll still be a non-negative number of ones. And this is going to be m times p times q minus m times p plus q. 
Okay, good. So these are two constructions of our number n as the sum and the product of the same numbers. So in other words, we do not have uniqueness in this case. So we finished this forward direction. We had already done the reverse direction. So that means we have a complete classification of good numbers. And that's a good place to stop.